Welcome students, faculty. Um, so tonight we have a, a great lecturer here, um, Trey Trahan, who is the founding principal um, and principal in charge of Trahan Architects, which is an innovative and award-winning emerging office located in New Orleans, formerly in Baton Rouge. I think you've recently made the, the crossover. Um, the firm has received widespread attention both nationally and internationally as a practice that is invested in and rooted in the place and informed by the local geography, culture, history, and the client's needs. Um, so the office was founded in 1992 and has since compiled a great body of diverse work that ranges in scale from universities, retail, industrial facilities, arenas like the Superdome, um, religious structures, museums, etc. Um, you know, an office size of about, range about 15 to 20 people. So it's actually interesting to see how they shift between um, a small scale project and a large scale project, and they're actually able to, to manage that. Um, the work shares a high level of technological sophistication and innovation, combined with the research into emerging materials and construction methods, um, which I think is apparent in the recently completed Louisiana State Museum, which probably a lot of you saw um, coming into the lecture. Um, it's actually on the poster out there. Um, so with their attention to details and materials, the firm has received numerous awards and honors, including three national AIA award, uh, awards in five years. Um, they have won three international competitions in China, so they're actually doing international work as well. Um, in 2005, Mr. Trahan was one of three winners and, and the only American designer to be selected by the Architects Review for an Emerging Architect Award in London. Trahan Architects were one of five US firms to be selected by Wallpaper Magazine's list of world's 101 best emerging design offices. Um, Mr. Trahan participated in the Architectural League of New York's 25th Anniversary Emerging Voices Lecture Series, which is an independent forum that recognizes architects whose work is gaining national and international attention. Um, and the list goes on and on. I won't name any more. Um, so with this, please join me in a warm welcome for Trey Trahan. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me here. It's a privilege. Um, I want to start out and change context a little. As we, um, as we were talking earlier today, I've become of recent really concerned about a number of things environmentally and especially as the population growth. We were talking earlier about how in 1960 there were 3 billion people on the planet and now there's 7.2 billion and the, we're predicted by most to be at 10 billion by 2050 and 2062 and which will require twice the amount of food that we're presently absorbing which the impact on the planet is um, if you begin to read Important books, one that we were talking about earlier, I would encourage you to look at this one by E.O. Wilson. Um, it's a phenomenal book on environmental issues. He and Stephen Keller, uh, E.O. Wilson's at Harvard, Stephen's at Yale. And they begin to raise some really important issues that I think um, architects better really begin to focus on and think about. And so I want to start here in Antarctica and um, a really beautiful place that most believe is pristine in, any, in many ways it is. And, um, and I'm starting here because I recently purchased a piece of property in Patagonia. And so I spend two to three, I go down there for probably a month, a year, two to three times, and I've become very aware of that unique and pristine environment. And so in Antarctica, as the sun comes out, the ice begins to fracture and uh, create these beautiful patterns. But I think what's, what's most important that I want to talk about today is, is those few days when the sun comes out, algae begins to develop underneath this ice. And the result of this is um, literally millions, maybe even billions of tons of creel. And creel are a shrimp-like crustacean. And here you see an image where you can see the currents begin to take uh, from Antarctica those krill up that westerly coast of Chile. And this is the piece of land I recently purchased, which is called Bahia Tiktok. And it's really important because it's a small piece in an 800,000 an 800, acre national park 
the water was just declared a marine park uh, for its unique ecology. And that is because the creel, as they move up the western edge of the Pacific Ocean, uh, of, of Chile, move into this bay. And they bring into this bay these incredible species from blue whales, which are a few hundred, a um, hundred feet long and a, uh, just enormous. They, they tell me the ecologists there and uh, well experts that their size of their heart is the size of a small car, but it's just, the species here are just unbelievable in this beautiful pristine area. The blue whales and the orcas come into the bay. And then there's a few rivers, uh, uh, Rio Fudlafu, Rio Bakar, Rio um, TikTok, that bring fresh water into this bay. And the result of that is the salinity level, 3% less than the rest of the water in the area. And the result of that is incredible marine life. Um, and so we spend an enormous amount of time uh, viewing penguins and sea lions and orcas and just all of this incredible sea life. I think what's equally important is the contribution that North America and other parts of the planet though are making. And so what we find on the beach, uh, this is a recent photograph of part of the beach and some of the plastics that are washing up there. And so what I'm trying to do is change the context. I think that we are, we have an incredible profession. Architecture is, uh, can provide a wonderful life, but I think we need to broaden the issues and change the context. And even think about at times not building. And I think this is part of our consumer society. And so I'm gonna move back now to our work and we'll go come back to this in the end. So some of our earliest work was with churches. And the beauty of that is the church dictates documents. Uh, in the early 1960s, the bishops promulgated in Catholicism documents that defined the role of the presider and people in the celebration of Eucharist and the other six sacraments in Christianity or in Catholicism. And so what was beautiful about that as a young architect was having a document that began to frame issues um, programmatically uh, so that as architects we brought the contextual issues. And this was a project in Santa Ma that quite candidly has been destroyed in many ways because the priests that took over the parish didn't believe in contemporary architecture and felt that it uh, diminished the sacredness of the community and so he's altered it. But it was a project of 2.5 million in a vast open field, very similar but a little more wet environment than you have here. And three small buildings, 2,500 square foot for religious education, an oratory and an administration building with a budget of right over $200 a square foot. And so what we found very compelling about this area of our state is the early Bousiage buildings. Bousiage in Louisiana was buildings that were constructed in the mid-17 to late 1700s. That is clay, horsehair, and moss, some of your greenest buildings. They had extracted clay from the site, uh, moss from the oak trees and horsehair, and mixed it in the loaves and created this beautiful, almost adobe-like material. And so that seemed to resonate with the administration at the time. And so it's a really simple planning uh, scheme, the sacred precinct, the oratory in the center playing with a sense of mystery, the way mystery occurs between the rotation but then finding yourself internally on an alignment coplanar with the, the uh, secular buildings, administrative, religious ed, classrooms around the perimeter. And so the depression occurs in locating this oratory, this mass. Um, for us, it was exploring casting place concrete materiality, uh, editing, uh, learning how we could integrate systems into architecture. Uh, for example, the, these apertures themselves serve as the supply and re return air uh, vent, so to speak. But also playing with construction systems. When we first did this project, our budget was 350000 It came in almost at a million dollars because we had called for plywood forms, but we quickly located uh, five axis milling machines and the ability to take styrofoam and carve out of styrofoam these, these form, this form work, reducing the project through construction means to the budget. A periform system, since there was a rotation, we could not incorporate what is referred to in construction as tie holes or she bolts, which hold the forms together. And so the forms were 
internally supported and then externally cantilevered resulted in this void where we layered or stacked this form work, this styrofoam that uh, was eventually chipped out to remove and create the oratories. So it's about some early Catholic um, and Christianity uh, planning principles of threshold and that choice of support or belief in your faith, whatever it is. But small but important uh, details embracing nature uh, and creating details just through the sequence of pores, uh, blocking out the wall and pouring this secondarily and create just a rich but for us a very meaningful moment. Things like stacking rebar on the back side of this cantilevered uh, cover and predetermining that its deflection would be approximately an inch, which it was, um, I think three quarters of an inch and allowing it to drain on other buildings. So finding creative ways of simplifying but creating uh, precious but important buildings in this landscape. And then choosing a, f a um, a mix in the concrete that has a, um, is really stiff and so when you vibrate it it does not reduce to a plumb or level position and so you get movement in the concrete and it begins to reveal the sequence of pouring or the, the casting of this concrete oratory. And then once again the door itself which was a cast glass door by John Lewis and instead of applying a typical handle just scooping out the jam of the door so that you begin to engage the jam and grasp the warmness the coolness of the cast glass and then the glass as it begins to engage uh, the uppermost part of the door carving and then internally the apertures themselves that were informed in Catholicism by the Paschal mystery the expulsion of light and then death and um, these are quite large give you a sense of scale this dimension is 20 feet by 20 feet and then because we did not have the budget to do some certain things we just took a three inch PVC pipe placed it in the formwork removed it and it serves as a light we put an MR16 so it gave us a very pure and authentic uh, lighting strategy and then the apertures themselves looking up through the apertures where the foam was placed and then the religious education building <coughs> always acknowledging that sacred precinct or that relationship to the oratory and the Cypress board forming that helped create um, that textural quality of the sacred building in contrast to the MDF form work of the, of the secular buildings. Furniture constructed of, um, of two and a quarter inch solid plaster on steel tubes just with a concrete sealer and then apertures in the walls embracing some of the 100 year oak trees some of the courtyards pre-landscaping, but bringing natural light into the building and using things like simple formwork like sauna tubes uh, to form these columns. And then just small shelves for kids to sit on and contemplate nature or play and, and of course experience some of the vegetation on the site. One thing I really enjoyed about the cast in place concrete is, is the trueness when, it's, when the sun hits it perpendicular but the softness that's revealed uh, when you have that parallel play of light on it as shown in this, this image. And then as the small things like the sinks themselves, the lavatories, instead of buying a storeboard lavatory, just casting a lavatory into the counter itself and creating a small reveal without that strainer that typically diminishes that as an experience of cleansing. Another church, we were hired to construct with a priest hired us and he said look I want to explore a traditional form but I want to also adopt Vatican II principles I'm open to any material except for concrete obviously I have pervasive uh, some persuasive qualities and we convinced him to go with cast in place concrete but also an, an, another small budget project of a, a building of 18,000 square feet with a budget of 2.8 million dollars and it was once again a pretty traditional form. We're just exploring uh, integration of systems once again, um, responding to context, thinking about natural systems, beginning to think about uh, early on biodiversity impact on site and what our role is as architects, but um, not really having the budget or um, I guess we were probably just at this point in my career overwhelmed with getting things built candidly. Um, so this is 
a structure with a, a vertical dimension of approximately 75 feet, um, internally um, express, both internal and externally expressed in the cast in place concrete, but also uh, in this octagonal form weaving this lattice work of, of uh, bronze anodized aluminum glass wall which brings natural light and reveals the neighborhood uh, in the context of the church also allowing us to express these chapels that have become mere niches in, in, in a lot of churches. But then exploring um, integration of systems of light behind this ring, you can actually walk behind the, the, the ring. There's a lift that takes you up and they change the lights. Integrating ductwork, spiral ductwork within the cast in place concrete, that dimension's 10 feet and it's five feet deep. And so it's internal to the, the cast in place solid concrete, which deals with noise and absorption and reverberation in the internal ductwork. The only object that we chose to bring from the original church was, was the baptismal font, the, uh, the, the kettle, which is an important part of Louisiana plantation culture, and each of the parishioners were baptized, and so it was the only piece that we retrieved and, um, and made a part of the architecture. But once again, just weaving this glass wall and revealing or expressing these chapels. So from private meditation to a larger celebration or gathering, uh, the church sits approximately a thousand people and the, I think the greatest distance is approximately 35 feet. So it was important to the priest that, that there wasn't varying degrees of participation and that began to drive or inform the volumetric uh, section of the building. But natural light, uh, an important part of it playing through these slight um, cracks within the roof system itself, these reveals beginning to elevate or express the walls and the seasons um, there. Another project, Louisiana State Academic, um, we were talking about this earlier, and the nice thing about this project was it was an all internal project, interior, and so uh, what it allows us to do was take this historic structure on LSU's campus and hone our skills of integration of mechanical and electrical and lighting systems, fire protection, strobes. Um, it became this game with us. And so we took the, the simple orthogonal planning and, and turned the gym into a, a, uh, a room for a thousand people in uh, both performance, but also lectures, then some labs on this lower level here, some private spaces for, this is for athletes it is for educating athletes. It was a commitment by, at that time, uh, a coach, Nick Saban. And so he felt like it was not only important to, um, um, to win national championships, but educate athletes. And so he committed to raising $15 million in 60 days, and he did. Uh, but it was a very simple structure. We created these, um, these bronze walls. Nick would take renderings of these around the state and throughout the country and he used these to generate funding for the project. But it was returning these original volumes that were down to eight, nine foot high ceilings to some of their uh, original um, uh, volumes, but also relining them with things like plaster ceilings and plaster cans, indirect lighting, and some natural stones that elevated the experience of these pure volumes. But Simple things like integration of, of, of supply air on one end of the room and return on the other. Large glass sheets. Uh, these sheets are six feet, uh, 11 inches wide by 14 feet tall, low iron. But once again, just expressing not only the original structure of the building, but returning it to useful volumes. Things that we enjoyed in this is, for example, in architecture, we're all aware of these strobes. And so we found a, a company that made these light strobes that could actually be embedded in walls. And when the circuit is tripped, they actually move into the space. So it became a game of, of, of integrating these, these different systems without reducing the impact. The supply air in this room is just a 7 8 inch reveal around the entire perimeter and then the structure itself began to inform the coffers of the room. <clears throat> Plaster is an important part of some of the early Louisiana buildings um, and some of the most important buildings on LSU campus. And here you can see that matte finish sealer. 
and then once again furniture that was constructed, study carrels that were constructed out of two and a quarter inch plaster systems on steel tubes. Recently we were invited by the mayor of Baton Rouge to create a stage. Our budget was $900,000 and, um, and it was to create a stage for performance. He said, Trey, as you are aware, less than 1% of the time the stage is used and so I hate to construct uh, one of these odd looking uh, performance systems with lights and speakers 100% of the time. Can you create something for $900,000 that is more sculptural? And so it's um, a plaza in downtown Baton Rouge with these disparate parts of the old state capitol, the river, the bridge, the Shaw Center, and a number of other important buildings. And so we created this, this piece that began to form, frame these different disparate parts and hopefully connect them in some ways. But one, a piece that has four different hook systems. And so the performance uh, truss itself is lifted into place. I apologize, we haven't photographed this yet. This was just recently completed. But we constructed it for 900,000 um, through competitive bidding. It was, it is constructed of steel plate. Um, it is, to give you a sense of dimensions, the cantilever is almost 90 feet. It's 40 feet tall and 40 feet wide. Um, I think this is important, especially for students to learn. Early pricing was over two million, and so we actually engineered it two ways, with pipe trusses and plate steel. And that's how we got competitive bidding that got it in budget. And so I think in architecture, you have to be equally and creative from the business side in creating ways of creating competition and bidding. If not, you create um, a condition where a certain subcontractor or entity that has an expertise basically owns your design or owns uh, uh, whether it, it, it happens or not. On that, I want to touch on, 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 um, on uh, so you, hear, you see here, it begins to take these parts and begins to connect through this framing device. Um, I, I want to stop at this time. I don't have images of it, but one thing that was mentioned earlier was we were the architects, lead architects on the Superdome. And I think this is another important thing that unfortunately no one told me early in our, my career. We, we continued to look for projects that were beautiful little opportunities of design. But what you quickly realize is money drives your firm. And so um, when Katrina hit, we submitted credentials for the Superdome. It was a $250 million project with 14 months for design and construction, which is, as you can appreciate, is pretty damn quick, right? Um, we were selected for the project. Interestingly enough, the dome is a 9.8 acre roof, 2 million square feet of building. We were asked to bid the roof first. We put together 15 sheets of drawings, which is nothing um, for a project, right? The first time it bid, it bid at 32.5 million. We had an 8% fee. FEMA called me up and said, you're going to reject it, right? $32.5 million to re-roof a dome. The reason that happened is because FEMA dictated that the contractor had to have the dome re-roofed before the next hurricane season or he was liable for the whole dome. And so I was asked to reject the bid. So I called my attorney up and I asked, what should I do? And he said, well, you can't because you're liable if you reject the bids. FEMA within the next 24 hours accepted our recommendation to accept the bids. We were paid 8% of 32 and a half million for 15 sheets of drawings. So when you get out, if you ever get a FEMA re-roofing job, I'll do it and split the profit with you. But, but seriously, I think that the story here is it's important to find business opportunities that help finance your passion. These things that don't necessarily make economic sense. Um, they also, projects like that, help build a practice in the sense we recently opened up a New York office. I was up there two weeks ago and a developer asked, he said, Trey, you've shown me all these beautiful little boutique projects, but what concerns me is you're like the typical architecture practice doing beautiful little interventions, but can you really run a business? Can you really run a big project? As a developer, I'm talking to you about a 75 to $150 million project. 
I pulled out the dome. By the way, we eventually did the dome. We were asked to do the dome 14 months initially. Paul Tagliabue came in and said, I'll give you $50 million towards the project if you can do it in seven months and open it for Monday Night Football. So not only did we make money, but it's helping us now get work in New York with developers because they see that we can run a business and run a project and go through a process of design and construction for $250 million in seven months. So back to the fun stuff. But that's an important part of the business. Magnolia Mound is this, uh, an early Creole plantation in Baton Rouge also. Um, Boosie Ice Building, structures that were originally constructed on the mound, all perpendicular to um, the grades, the topography of this mound that at this time, of course, elevated these structures above the flooding. Now, of course, the levee is in place, and uh, so the site um, is not threatened by that. And so it's a small 4,000 square foot building, really small program, a little meeting space, a little gallery space, uh, a welcoming center, a visitor center, but a building that the strategy here is um, this datum, this line, is the top of the mound, and so all the historic buildings are built on top, and so this new modern contemporary intervention is now embedded below. So something really simple, but I think uh, um, an important, respectful building that, um, that not only will serve its programmatic purpose, but um, would reflect a genuine respect for the historic buildings on the site. This will be completed in the next uh, 90 to 120 days, I think. So it's in construction. And then the project most people enjoy, this, is, um, this has kind of been part of a long journey of, of, of our interest in biodiversity and biomass and in this book I speak of. I, I, um, I'm becoming really concerned the more I learn about our environment and what we're doing to it. Um, most scientists predict, not including microbial, that we're, there are approximately eight to 10 million species on the planet, that it took approximately three and a half billion years to create. Uh, we've lost, if you believe these guys, over 20% of that over the past 50 years. Um, our extinction rate is 1,000 to 10,000 times more than it was prehabitation. So we became really interested in a number of things, and that is uh, the basic thought that over the past 200,000 years of evolution, less than 1% of that has been spent in built work. 99 has been in natural environments. And so I am interested in um, we as a biological species in a biological world, um, that kind of affiliation, that genetic affiliation within us to connect with place. And, um, and I think that asks a lot of our profession. I think, uh, at least in my career, maybe this is an unfair criticism, I think that our profession in general has been devoid of really thinking and talking about these things. And I think we need to talk about them. So for us, when we were commissioned to design a museum in, in Natchitoches, Louisiana, um, a building of 30,000 square feet, a budget of $12.5 million, that's not a lot, that's about $430, $440 a square foot for a museum. And as you can appreciate, museums have uh, high environmental systems costs, mechanical, electrical costs. Um, we began to investigate the uniqueness of place, uh, both from a biodiversity, endemic species, extinction, all of these things, and asked ourselves a lot of questions. What has the river done to shape and carve and, carve and build Louisiana? How does it deposit and scour? And by the way, Louisiana is losing a football field of landmass every 40 minutes. Um, and that's been taking place for the past, I think, since the late 1920s because of the levee of the river and our lack of, of sediment replenishing, freshwater replenishing. So water is an important part of our culture. But also asking questions about some of the early parceling, the French arpent measure, and how it began to define some of the early parceling, that kind of democratic process, um, which is silly in some way because you you own an equal percentage of river frontage one day and the next year because of the way the river deposits and scours, that changed. 
But then also we begin to analyze this kind of downtown area and this urban loop. This is at the convergence of, of, of a residential neighborhood and what they refer to as, I mean, it's a small town, their urban loop. And they're concerned that the state had chosen a building immediately outside of their urban loop. So the question was, uh, the challenge was, how can we connect or bring people into this small urban loop? But also thinking about not only the way rivers deposit and shape and the impact it had on culture and politics and the er early built works of Louisiana and specifically <coughs> this region, but um, how farmers shape and carve and, and respond to soil conditions and biodiversity and these things. And so we began to further chart uh, the point bars and the different ways that rivers carve and shape and cut off and create oxbows and things like that. Uh, all the while asking, because we had no interest in mimicking the way natural forces shape buildings, but we did become interested in a number of facts. And it started with kids. Um, Stephen Kellett talks about in his book how a generation ago, children would spend four to five hours a day outdoors, and they not only learned a tremendous amount about nature, but nature taught, I guess my generation, adaptive skills and how to learn and how to respond to changing environments. And then he goes on to prove, I believe, uh, how diversity in natural settings um, it plays an important part, not emotional development, in both emotional development, but cognitive development, and begins to question um, the built environment and the lack of engagement uh, with our environment. And so we started to ask those questions. Can, um, can architecture respond in a way? It included studying Fisk maps. Harold Fisk was a professor at LSU, and so he, um, he loved cataloging, creating these maps of the historical meandering of the river pre-levy and its effect on politics and culture and agrarian life. Um, and then the way sectionally rivers begin to change and the way sediment at different stratas carve and shape and how they create this point bar, this transition zone. Um, and then we built models both digitally and physically of this particle distribution and understanding the diversity and complexity of this. All the while thinking about materials and also how we can begin to organize these galleries and so these are just models the size of your hand and looking at different ways that um, these we would apply these strategies to the program itself and then increasing the model scale um, as we began to shortlist these and respond to the mandates of it but then looking at the scale of this organic carving within uh, the context uh, digitally of the neighborhood both urban and then using our laser cutter in-house to build even larger models we built a number of these. Uh, at this point, we began to communicate with the AA in London, Zaha's office and shop, and we talked about materiality, and each of them were adamant in saying, look, if, you begin, if, you're, gonna, if you're serious about a complex shape, um, our advice is use a material that is millimeters or less than an inch thick, definitely not cast in place concrete, most definitely not cast stone. Uh, because the cast stone panels would range anywhere from four and a half to five inches thick and weigh uh, at times six to seven tons. And so you can appreciate not only the complexity of, 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 of um, all of those different shaped surfaces, but attaching that to a steel structure. So we studied various ways of, of, of developing this panelization, all the while thinking about diversity and experience and these things we're learning from nature. We used Maya to shape it, and then we studied it uh, further with, um, with Grasshopper and Rhino, and eventually brought it into uh, Revit. Um, at one point, we had Fire Marshal buy off, because uh, a steel structure with, with um, well, as you probably know, we went with cast stone. Uh, a ca even a cast stone structure, uh, or steel structure with cast stone, uh, required full coverage of, of sprinkler systems and so we had buy off from the fire marshal to only find out that um, uh, someone a superior in his office rejected the coverage and we had to reshape the whole surface 
um, because of the coverage of sprinkler systems in a shaped surface. And so it's terribly important and part of it. Some of the longitudinal sections and the transverse sections that have eventually led to the construction documents of this. I found this very interesting. Typically in Louisiana and in most states, when you submit a project to government bodies, there are architects and engineers on staff and they mark up your drawings. I don't care who you are as an architect. They mark them up. They have more red lines on your drawings and you have ink. When we submitted this project to the state, we received no markups, no comments. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is interesting that if you take the dialogue to a place where someone can't participate in the construction documents, you eliminate them from the process. <laughs> Something to remember. Um, and so we worked with Case to identify over 1,100 cast stone panels. As I said, the largest are six to seven tons. Uh, the joints are three-eighths of an inch. That's an incredible tolerance for a highly complex structure. Um, each was coded and identified. They were, we, we uh, sent the digital files to uh, five-axis milling machines and routers to cut each of the, the formwork out of high-density foam. Candidly, now that I'm becoming this sensitive environmentalist, I'm concerned about where all this foam is. It was a lot of foam, and that is a problem. And so right now we're studying other ways of creating complex shapes, formworks, including pneumatic systems that move uh, layers of, of this uh, rubberized material where you could use a, f uh, a rubber material to create deformations or shape surfaces repeatedly creating different complex shapes. So further work in Kate with current case, there were 28 different connection details, some were blind connections where uh, a group of six and seven men would actually lift a panel in place for a soffit or a ceiling and they would have an eye connection, they'd slide it over. Um, it was, it was um, the impact of, of this, these heavy stones was such that they would place a cast stone panel and it would deform the whole internal steel structure over an inch and so they would have to calculate where the next panel went to return the structure to its pre-deformation state so you could install the next panel and meet the tolerances. So it was quite an interesting game all the time. By the way, this was our first Maya project, first Rhino project, first Revit project, first museum. Traditionally something that would bankrupt the firm. Um, <laughs> but we were committed. And so this is just a number of, of images of, um, well, let me go back here. Here, the connections, the steel frame, the outer steel frame, some of the complexity. Arup, a few guys from Arup worked on this. Um, so a lot of really smart people. Uh, some of the connections uh, in the digital model, all of it was put in BIM, including mechanical electro and all the systems uh, to coordinate. And then the exterior, uh, an exterior that was informed by some of the historic plantations where cypress uh, louvers are an important part for both air and uh, control and natural light ventilation. And so uh, we remember have a budget of $430 a square foot, but we're asked to use copper for an exterior. And so we began to, begin to investigate pleating the copper. Internally going back, we at times had to, um, or the contractor had to uh, suspend from the steel structure of these giant steel tubs with lead weights in an attempt to hold the structure in place as these giant cast stone pieces were attached. And then the final building, uh, one with these beautiful copper louvers, it um, initially, again, it didn't come in budget. We bid it. Low bid was 19 million for a 12 million five project. We had designed it and worked with a group out of Atlanta um, on the cast stone for three years. And they committed for three years to bidding the cast stone at $150 a square foot. On bid day, they were low bid at almost $400 a square foot for surface area. They called after bid day and they said, well, we understand it's over budget, but we assume since it's a state job that the state's going to fund it. And I told them no, because I'd gotten the call that they weren't, that we had to redraw it all at our expense. The subcontractor flew, flew down and asked if there was any way to save the project. 
I called my attorney, asked if we could sign an agreement in a public bid, if he could commit to bidding it, where he told us he would bid it for three years. They agreed to it. He signed an agreement that if I rebid it, he would bid it for the hundred and something dollars a square foot. I put it back out for bid without changing the documents. It came in under 12 million five. It came in at 11 seven from almost 20, and he wasn't even low bid. It tells you the profit in some of these jobs, especially when you push. So it ended up what I think is a beautiful building. It's it's uh, in some circles well received. Some it's been very it's been heavily criticized. Azure Magazine just named it uh, the top building in the world of 2013. I find that I mean it's a great compliment, but it's a, it's kind of silly in some ways, right? There's no really a top building. But I think the story you hear is a group of architects uh, in South Louisiana choosing to push things really far, committing to it, embracing technology, uh, searching to validate architecture uh, through an early investigation into natural systems, an appreciation for biodiversity and biomass. I in no way suggest and can, can sit here and say it is authenticated through that. But I can say to you and commit to you that we are committed to uh, exploring all these issues and finding various ways of connecting the technology we have today with some important environmental issues of, that are important to us. And we think that um, as we all question technology, um, often when I lecture, I speak of uh, my concerns for technology that just because you can doesn't mean you necessarily should and so at times I question that here just because we could should we have and I think that's an important question all architects have to ask um, but I think it ended up um, it, it, well it's making an important contribution to this community a community where many people don't leave um, it's interesting to walk through this building and hear kids talk about the building. Of course, you know, if you've never left Louisiana, this is, and you don't read architecture magazines, this is pretty far out there, right? But um, the community has embraced it. Uh, they're beginning to fund um, uh, important aspects of it, and that is it's a sports museum, a history museum, and so it was not about environmental issues and connecting to the uniqueness of place, but it was also about the sports component. Uh, projecting sports imagery, film footage, onto shaped surfaces? And can there be a dynamic relationship between film footage and, um, and the canvas itself, the projection? And so here you see they're beginning to project some of the images of the sporting events on the walls themselves. But once again, um, some of our earlier skills are beginning to integrate mechanical and electrical and lighting systems into these shaped surfaces. I think the total calculation was over 500 tons of cast stone. Candidly, I question that now. Um, should we really do that? Is there a more creative or innovative way of doing that? Um, what impact have we made on the environment in building something like this? And candidly, it took a toll on everyone. It brought, uh, in many ways, my firm to our knees. It brought the contractor to his knees. Um, the client didn't care. They said, we're paying you this much and do it. Um, but I think it makes an important uh, contribution to, to architecture uh, in the state and region and hopefully nationally um, in, in that we chose to push and ask many things and we effectively delivered a building um, with, um, I think, uh, meaningful, important, rich uh, materials um, that will age and uh, patina beautifully, both internally and externally. So I think it makes a, um, a significant contribution um, to the community. I'll end on this interesting story. So I'm with Tim Hursley, who's an incredible uh, photographer of architecture, and there's a bar next door. I don't have pictures, but we have one picture. And there's two guys in their early 60s sitting on the front porch of this bar. And Tim Hursley has his camera, and he's moving around outside for about 30 or 45 minutes, trying to decide what's the best view angle for the photograph. 
And one of the guys at the bar says, it don't matter what angle you take it from, all you're going to see is ugly. <laughs> that night we had a beer with him and we spent three hours talking to him about the building. At the opening ceremony, he attended and spoke to the press for 30 minutes about how important it was to the community. <laughs> Thank you. So, any questions, comments, critiques, thoughts? Yes. Well, you know, it's a, it's a historic, it's the oldest settlement in the Louisiana Purchase. So it's pretty traditional buildings throughout the context of Front Street on the river. And so we wanted to maintain kind of the mass and in scale of these orthogonal buildings on the outside. But at the same time, we wanted to engage that urban circulation loop, the way people meander in this circulation loop. And we wanted to connect to the way rivers shape and scour and deposit. Um, but we also wanted to create and test and play with an, an internal experience that, um, well, if you think about it, I mean, so many artificial things in our society, some are saying, um, do have emotional impacts. They reduce systolic pressures and things like that and affect adrenaline and all those things. And, but they're artificial, right? And so we question whether the artificial built environment could begin to play with diversity and complexity and adaptation and bring those things that um, the natural environment affect, how it affects us, to a built work. Um, it's, look, this is early in our journey. We, we see this as, we hope this, we look back and we say, wow, it, it wasn't validated as well as it could be that now our work is really validated. It's really connected to natural system. It's really connected to understanding all these environmental issues um, and that this almost seems primitive in a way. Uh, but we had to start. We had to begin the journey and we were willing to take those risks. Other questions? Yes. Um, so <clears throat> I, I certainly appreciate the honesty in terms of the reflection of the work. It seems like you, in most of the projects you made some kind of comments or in between projects commenting on uh, reflecting and maybe recalibrating the office in particular endeavors, especially for issues of biodiversity and, and so on. Um, a lot of times in the discussion of um, trying to heighten our understanding of our natural environment, we we, as architects, really need to collaborate with individuals that are quite intelligent in natural systems. Or yeah. So how do you see, in terms of the reflection of the work, um, where that could be placed and how that could, uh, what kind of um, collaborations could be cultivated, yeah. even though you have to juggle this big ball of economics and making the, the office run? Yeah. yeah, I think it's a critical question. Well. We finally reached a point where we're starting to receive the right calls. You know, that's what you want. Like we were recently called six months ago for a pretty significant commission at New Atlanta Symphony Hall, which is part of Woodruff. First building was Richard Myers High. Second building was uh, Renzo Piano's building. Uh, we were just selected for the third, the Performing Arts Building. So that's, that is positioning us financially where we're not chasing every lead like we used to. And that's an important part of the economic engine. Um, it's allowing me some freedom to leave the office to, to travel nationally, internationally, and meet with ecologists, biologists, botanists, people like this, and talk about these things. Um, no one's figured it out. And of course, I kind of like that because I want to figure it out. Um, I would like to be the guy. I, I, 
the guy I meet with often in South America is a guy by the name of Doug Tompkins. If you've never heard of him, look him up. He's fascinating. He started North Face in a spree. He's become a great friend. At 49, he decided he was part of the problem. He has purchased two and a half million acres and um, donated it all to Chile and Argentina for national parks. But the point of this story is he's connecting me to, um, I think, the right ecologist. Um, last time I was at, in Chile, I spent two weeks uh, with Doug Reed that I brought, flew Doug Reed down the landscape architect with Reed Hildebrand out of Boston. Uh, we brought Carlos Cuevos, South America's top ecologist, and a guy named Francisco Vita, who is considered uh, South America's expert on the whales. And we spent two weeks in the rainforest just talking about ecology, systems. Um, talking about on this piece of land, um, how we increase biodiversity by just creating a clearing. Um, and they explained to me how the uh, greatest biodiversity of biomass happens in the edges, in all the edges, the transitions of these ecological systems, and that if we want to create uh, increased biomass on this site, that we need to determine in different ecological zones where we carve and where it increases edges to increase penguins or different bird species or different flora species. And I find that fascinating. Um, I, we haven't figured out how we connect all that to architecture, but we're hoping in collaborating with artists and botanists and biologists and ecologists and a lot of really smart people that we may figure that out. But I, and I've been, look, I've been calling BS on the profession, this contextualism candidly for a long time, and myself. You know, we all talk about it's contextual. We've been doing that for a long time. It's the scale of the adjacent buildings. It has respect for culture. It has respect. I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I can't imagine what they're going to say about us in 100 years. Um, wow, they, they're responsible. This generation, these few generations, killed 50% of the endemic species. Um, and look, they thought they were building contextual. That's not contextual. You know, it's, um, so I don't know what the answer is, but I want to be one of the guys that's committed to figuring that out. And I think it takes all of us. I also think, and maybe I shouldn't go there, but I think it's true in what I've learned. I think, and I think your generation is seem to be much more responsible than my generation. I think it also is a life of choosing less consumerism. Because I can tell you all this consumerism begins to drive your architectural practice like you can't believe. As long as you're feeding that addiction of that great car and that great house and all this stuff, you make choices running a business that's not in the best interest of society or yourself or anybody, because you've got to build. And um, Doug, Doug Tompkins, the guy who in South America that I've become good friends with, I'm in the rainforest one night, it's midnight, we're drinking wine. Two reporters flew down from Switzerland, and the lady asked him, she said, um, really touched me. She said, what drives a man to give away his billion dollars to two countries, build natural parks, national parks, and give them all this land? And he said, what drives a man to die with more than a dime in his pocket? And I thought, wow, that's pretty damn good. He said, in the end, I think society will judge us, and I think this is important for architects to hear, by not only by what we build, but what we refrain from destroying. And I think that I think our profession, it's not expected, but we need to take a leadership role in beginning to really push for the importance of these issues. And I think there's no better profession that is great at problem solving, is romantic in ways, is sensitive in ways, and really cares. And I think we need to be on the leading edge of that. And we need to figure that out. And we bring, need to bring attention to it. So. Other questions? I had a question about uh, what, I, I haven't told the parts, but what attracted you to Chile uh, or, or Patagonia more specifically? And it's all like opened up all this opportunity for you. So have you, I know you have a lot going on down there, but have you considered moving other places in the world to kind of see uh, how you can become more connected and maybe have some more opportunities open up and I guess build your rapport with the yeah. ecological Background. Well, I have my hands full in Chile, but um, um, what, I received an email one night from a guy out of Buenos Aires. It was a story, and I was talking about ecological issues, and 
I was kind of taking a shot across the bow of most of all, all of us architects, including me, saying that, you know, we're as great a profession as we have and as beautiful as we build, we're reckless in a lot of ways. So I get an email from a guy and he said, he asked me a series of questions. He asked me questions for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, he said, this isn't even for me. This is for my boss and he's going to email you tonight. And that night was this guy, Doug Tompkins. And he emailed me for a week asking a series of questions of architecture, built work, and connections, and he's good friends with Ando and Foster, because when he had a spree, he hired them to do all these projects. And so after, at the end of the week, he invited me down to spend 10 days with he and his wife in Patagonia. I said, this guy's crazier than I am. I better look him up and see who he is. And I, that's when I found out who he was. And so I traveled down. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's such a complex set of issues. Um, and it's overwhelming when you start reading about it. I mean, you just, we were talking before about, you know, as horrific as this plane crash is in Malaysia, I keep hoping at least one positive thing that comes out of it is every night they talk about on the new, nightly news that they think they've located a part of the plane. And regrettably not, but what they talk about is they located some more trash in the ocean. I'm hoping at least it brings some, some, uh, acknowledgement by the world of how much junk is out there. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And you know, this stuff doesn't break down. It breaks down into small pellets. And then it starts floating up on our beaches and then all the animal life starts eating these plastic pellets. So it's pretty serious stuff. Um, if these guys are right, we'll have lost 40 to 50% of our biodiversity in the next 50 years. I don't know about y'all, but I can't imagine what the future generations are going to say, you killed off half the species on the planet recklessly. Anyway, I hope to build on this. I hope um, at the National Convention I have 40 friends getting together. We get together every year, Marlon Blackwell, Larry Scarpa, Tom Kunde, Rick Joy, all of us, we get together and I'm going to give a talk this year to the group about, you know, we need to, we need to be on the forefront of these issues. Um, it's just not acceptable anymore just to accept commissions and build to build. I don't think so. That's where we're moving our practice anyway. Other questions? Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>